screen. Um, I'll be talking just briefly in the interest of time uh, about flipping the classroom. Some of you may have heard about flipping the classroom. I'll briefly motivate uh, the, the reason to consider this and what it is. Um, and the motivation for this is that different parts of the learning process are uh, associated with different amounts of difficulty. So um, there's a, a phase in which material is just transmitted, uh, such as through reading a book or um, putting them on board, talking to the students, conveying information. Um, and that's usually something that they can do. They've been taking notes and lectures for a very long time, and they can get stuff written down. Uh, and this part is not actually cognitively that intensive, whereas the actual assimilation of the material into their um, um, base of expertise, their ability to use the material, the ability to think critically using the techniques that you share with them, this is actually very difficult. Um, to maximize value of the faculty member in, in a situation in which there's different tasks of different difficulty, you'd like to uh, maximize the time with the faculty during the difficult part of the learning process. Unfortunately, as proponents of flipped classrooms will tell you, um, the part that we traditionally spend with them is the easy part, the transmission of information where they're just taking notes, frantically trying to keep up, and the part where they're actually trying to assimilate the information, typically late at night where they have a copy of the notes and they're trying to figure out what the heck you were saying. Um, that's the difficult part, but you're no longer there to give them any assistance. And so the idea behind the flipped classroom is to say, can we rearrange the way information is presented and different parts of the experience are presented to, to better align the difficult things with the faculty time? And so all it really consists of is having them be exposed to the information before they come to class and trying to spend class doing more examples, answering more questions, having them do activities that you've set up ahead of time so that you can be there to answer questions. It's really trying to maximize questions and answers between the students and the faculty. And that can only really happen if they've had some exposure, ideally a lot of exposure, to the material before they come to class. I'll be talking about using screencasting as a means of doing that. Um, briefly, how did I get to where I am today? Um, I first was exposed to these ideas a few years ago and thought, okay, this is a good idea. I will require reading in some form. I will require them to read their textbook. And in a math class, that's a pretty hard sell. Um, so you need to highly incentivize the reading of a math textbook before they come to class. Um, having done that, I typically prepare pretty, pretty readable notes. And so I thought, you know, hey, why don't I just distribute my notes before class? You can read the book and look at my notes. Uh, and then in class, we can go a little bit more quickly. Um, I quickly realized that if they already had my notes, there was no use in me recopying my notes onto the board. And so instead of copying them onto the board, I would just put them up on the screen. So I might go through a lecture with my actual notes and just sort of point at it with a laser pointer and discuss the notes instead of rewriting them on the board. The idea being that the students already have a printed copy of the notes. I don't need to rewrite them again. They don't need to rewrite them again. We can spend more time just talking and thinking. Um, and finally, the last step of this process is if there's a step of this uh, where I'm just putting my own notes on the board and talking, why don't I just put that in a video and have them watch it before class and then come to class and have the question and answer session. So that's kind of how I got to this uh, uh, stage of doing things. Um, what do you actually need? How much is it going to cost me? Um, here are the things that you need. Uh, you can either use a tablet PC, as, uh, as Paul demonstrated, those are about $1,500, or um, if you're willing to write down here and have your handwriting appear up here, it's a little bit disconcerting, but this is called a, a, a tablet. It is the actual device that is integrated into the screen of a tablet PC. It's just a whole lot cheaper. So you can go that route. I, I don't have the, the cash uh, provided by my department to so just buy myself a tablet PC, but I was able to get one of these tablets through this uh, teaching and technology committee, so that was really helpful. You need some kind of software for recording the image of your screen, combining it with the audio from your microphone, and making a file out of it. Uh, in Windows, I understand a popular one is called Camtasia Studio. Um, but if you just Google screencasting software, which will be presented with many options, they're all basically the same. You click a button, it starts recording your screen. You finish, you click another button, and it stops. Uh, I, have, I have a different solution that I'll use here, but that's not really important. Um, I also like to use a, a little bit higher quality microphone than the kind that's on your computer already or that might be in a, in a simple headset. Um, and this one got pretty good reviews. It's, it's made by a company called Samson. And it just has a little bit um, better recording range and it filters out some of the pops associated with various letters of the alphabet. So it makes for a little bit better audio, which is an important part of, of, the, of the, the video that you make. 
Um, and finally, a note-taking program is helpful, something that you can write on PDFs as is already been demonstrated. Windows Journal or iAnnotate or, or PDF into any of these kinds of things. But the key thing is that you need something to talk about in your video. And I highly recommend against just trying to talk while you write. There's a lot of videos online where people are talking while they're writing, and there's a lot of pausing, and there's a lot of waiting for the person on the video to write. And it can be kind of excruciating at times, especially if they're not exactly confident in what they're going to say ahead of time. Um, so like I said, I had these notes already that I was distributing. I just walked through them in my video itself. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll illustrate some of these things below. Um, I'm going to briefly summarize this, and then I'll give you a very short demonstration. So the goal, again, I cannot really think well on my feet unless I know exactly what I'm going to say ahead of time. Um, if I deviate from my script, it, it can throw me for a loop unless it's something that I'm very, very comfortable with. Um, so then you have everything you need open, ready to go. Uh, for instance, for this talk, I have a bunch of um, I have a bunch of windows open that will flip between, so I don't need to worry about opening files. I start my recording. I go to my slides, I begin narrating, I mark out my notes or whatever, I finish walking through it, I end the recording, and, um, and then I just upload it to YouTube. And it's ready, it's done. So I'll give you a brief demonstration of this process. So here are my notes, um, all ready, waiting for me. Like I said, I have a, a custom way of um, actually creating these videos that um, don't concern yourself about the man behind the curtain. Um, <laughs> there are easier ways to do this than I have it, and that shouldn't freak you out. So I'll begin my recording. Um, I'll go up to my, my notes here, and I have here my, my tablet ready to go, so I could be walking through this particular lecture on parametric surfaces and uh, hitting the high points, showing some, some illustrations, and then suppose I want to pause and, and really emphasize something, uh, I could um, select you know, a highlighter tool, which is a standard part of these programs, and I could, I could highlight what it is that I'm trying to say, and this will show up on the video. Right? Uh, I could show anything that I could normally do on my desktop or my video. I could, I could flip over to a YouTube video and display a video of something amazing that would really help make the point I'm trying to make. And it would show up in my screencast. Okay, so suppose that was it. That was a pretty short uh, screencast. I'll now end the video. And if uh, technology continues to work the way it's supposed to, Right, so there it is. That's the video that I just made right here. Um, it's all ready to go. Video's ready. Um, that's a, a really nice feature that, that the video's just ready. When you're done, it's ready to go. It's ready to upload. So I go over to my YouTube account. I have a YouTube account, and I, I go to my upload section, and I, I choose to uh, upload a video. And uh, it's going to want me to drag and drop in there. Can I? Here we go. So let me find a movie that I just made. It and it begins uploading. While, while it's uploading, YouTube asks me some questions. Uh, you know, example during the presentation, uh, and I can put some you know other information. But here it is. Uh, it's uploaded. Uh, YouTube does some processing to put it in different formats. Uh, that it gives me importantly, it gives me a link right away, even if it needs to spend some time thinking. So here's the link. Video is not quite ready yet. That's fine. I go ahead and copy this location of my video, and I go over to my Blackboard page, and I have uh, a discussion board where I ask students to comment on the video. So not only do I want them to watch it before class, I want them to comment. So I have them watch the video, and then uh, I come over here, I create a thread for them. Delete their comments. I post my link, and I'm done. Done for the day. That's all done, it's ready, it's posted, it's online, the students will go do it, they'll go do it, um, they'll post their questions, they'll come to class, hopefully, uh, with, with other stuff. So, that's that, the process of making the videos. Once you kind of get a workflow going, is not that bad. It really only takes you about as much time as it takes you to actually speak the video into existence. Um, it's not a huge drain on, on resources of your, of your time. Uh, Here we go. Summary. Um, what have been my impressions on this? Uh, I, I did this, you know, again, hoping to get more on class time. I even, with a colleague, set up a little experiment where he's teaching the class the regular way, uh, the traditional way. I do it the traditional way for the first exam, and then, we, then I switch, and we measure to see if there's any impact. So we're trying to have a control group and an experimental group, and we did this experiment last semester, and we did it again this semester. 
So here are my thoughts so far. I mean, you can, you can see it. I won't um, read them to you. Um, I definitely felt weird the first few times. I tried to make my video while writing at the same time, and it was a disaster. I thought, this is just like classroom. In the classroom, I write on the board, and, and I speak at the same time. It's a disaster, because there's no feedback. I, I, I enjoy lecturing. Um, I like the feedback of the students. I have a good time with them. And that's just all absence. You're staring at a white screen, and you're writing on there, and you're making mistakes. They have the tiniest mistake, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm sorry, let me go fix this mistake. And, and there's nobody there to like laugh or give you any kind of encouragement or feedback or anything. It's just you, you want to quit right away. Um, so that's why it's important for me, anyway, to have everything all ready to go. And, and that really kind of minimizes my, my, uh, uh, my fear. Um, so, like I said, I like Lexter. It's a big adjustment for me to do that. Um, it's also an adjustment for the students. They, I will probably summarize, they don't like it. Overall, they don't like it. Some of them really do. They think it's cool, exciting. They're, they're part of something new and trendy, but like as a whole, they just don't like it. It feels like extra work to them, even though um, what I do in class is more than my colleague in the, the control group, but they have consequently less homework. I try to actually do the homework that the other class is doing at home, I try to do some of that in class with them, but they still think they're doing more work. Um, and so there will be resistance. You will think, this is great, this is trendy, they won't, they'll, they'll resist you. Uh, yeah? You said you had to incentivize the students to do the reading ahead of time. Yes. Are you finding the same thing here? Uh, I think what yes. Do do? What do you do? I mean, do you, are you finding that the students are actually listening to stuff ahead of time? Or are they trying to somehow magically cram the semester's worth of stuff on the night before? So I, I make a small portion of their grade their comment in the form okay. after the video. They watch the video, they leave a comment, and I, I go back and I look and see who did it and who didn't. And that's a small portion of their grade. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can do whatever. So that's, that's what I have. Um, my, my goal sort of throughout all this is to not make it take more time to prepare than my normal preparation. Because as we all know, you know, the tenure committee is going to be looking at research uh, than they are at teaching. And so uh, large investments of time, probably not a good idea. At least that's how it is in my department. So this, this I found not take a whole lot more time than my normal preparation. Um, and, and this is a simple way to do it. It's pretty easy. But you don't have any data yet about how the kids did. I do. The first semester there was a small improvement. And uh, I wish I had the graph. That would have been a good idea. Um, it, it, it seemed to help more the weaker students. And what I did notice anecdotally is that the students who normally would sit in the back of the classroom and just you'd never hear a word out of them all semester and they'd get about a B minus or a C plus, they were actually asking me questions during class. I'd wander, I'd physically wander around the room, how are you doing, can I, can I help you guys with anything? And they would actually ask questions for the first lecture or two. They got used to it, they would actually ask questions. Uh, and they then seemed to do really better on the exams, a little bit, the, the students on the lower end. The students on the top, no change at all. You know, those are the kids who are going to do fine no matter what you do. Um, there did seem to be an improvement on the students uh, closer to the bottom of the class. But at the same time, you know, all I did was did homework problems in class. I, I have not been trained how to sort of be a guide uh, in the classroom. I've been trained to be a lecturer, and so I've been trained in presentation skills and making jokes and making class lively and everything, and, and that is not what I do anymore. And so I feel a little bit useless, like, you know, <laughs> what, what am I really doing here? None of the skills that I had developed for the past five, ten years are being used anymore in this new style. I'm just kind of wandering around asking them to do homework problems. So what I'm really wrestling with now is what other things can I do with my class time? Um, how can I maximize the value of that? Uh, and uh, I still don't have the answer. Just, you know, reading around, trying to find some recommendations. That's, that's where I'm at right now. Because to me, I've started doing this this semester of education psychology. So I'm trying to do sort of active learning sorts of things in class. Mm -hmm. So, but I am convinced half the class still is doing this. Yeah, study. you know, and the comments are no um, uh, magic bullet. They can just copy someone else's comment. I didn't understand the second half. Yeah. Okay. I'll give the quizzes in Blackboard that disappear. Yeah, so that's, so that's you know. the quizzes in Blackboard are better. I mean, this is definitely can complement lots of other things. You can have Blackboard quizzes. I have chosen not to do that because it takes me extra time. And it's just a time yeah, thing. So I wondered if you were just getting generally more participation in class. It feels like it. Because I'm wandering around and asking people specific questions, it really feels like it. Um, that's all I can say. Uh, you could use clickers during the class. You could have carefully constructed questions and clickers and talk to your neighbor and like there's all kinds of in-class things that you could do. This, all this does really is free up class time to do more hands-on stuff. And what you choose to do with that hands-on time is not something I can offer a lot of advice on. I'm still trying to figure it out myself. So 
the other value you have is you have a great library of pre-made things already. Have you found that to be very useful? I'm finding it very useful this semester as I teach the class again. 